WRWH.com. Now, here's Nathan. Well, good morning, gang. How are we this morning on this beautiful September e- more, uh, September Saturday? It is great and it's glorious. We're uh, not really too hot this morning, so it's a great time to get out, to get growing, to get your hands dirty, and to uh, learn more and to help build your relationship with the soil, as I like to say. Uh, this morning, of course, we are here to answer your questions. If you have any, feel free to give me a call at 706-865-3181. Or, of course, you can send them to info at wrwh.com. And this morning, that's exactly what we have. We actually have had a, um, a special, we actually have a special guest today, I need to tell you. So you'll hang on for the next half hour. Uh, sometime after 9.30, we're going to have on Joe Phillips. She is uh, with uh, Horticulture at Hills and Dales Estates in LaGrange, which uh, is part of the Callaway uh, business down there. So uh, definitely hang on to see and or, so you can learn more about what they have going on at Hills and Dales, some of the history there, uh, as well as the gardening techniques and plants um, that they utilize in the gardens at Hills and Dales. Of course, we have Ethel's Garden Soliloquy. It'll be a little earlier in the show. And we have my plan of the week. So we have a big, really big show uh, this morning. And of course, we're going to be answering your questions. I'd, I'd like to start off this morning by doing just that, answering a question from Veronica, who um, we didn't get her message till right at the end of last week's show. And we wanted to make sure that we get Veronica from Gainesville and answer. Here's her question. She says, I, I have planters outside of my house. I would love to place some plants in them, but I have no idea uh, what plants are good for fall. Any suggestions? So, Veronica, there are not as many plants uh, that you could use, like annual plants with flowers and, and whatnot, uh, as you can use in the spring. But don't be discouraged because there are plenty that you can utilize. Uh, of course, I guess we have to go with the top two classic uh, plants, which one being um, uh, pansies, right? So, of course, everyone knows about pansies. They've been around for a long time. And with that in mind, you can use those in your planters, of course. Um, in addition to pansies, another one that is a really big um, fall time plant would be garden mums. Garden mums, they are a highly, <laughs> highly uh, unique um, plant that people, growers start to grow, actually. Um, a little earlier than now because they're almost ready. Um, you do see some out and about uh, at some of the box stores. But I'll let you know, Veronica, that this type of plant, if you see them in the box stores, it's a little too early right now. They like to get in there and get the as many sales as they can. Um, but if you go to a local independent nursery like Lanier Nursery and Gardens, you'll find them to be just a little bit later, uh, later this month and into early October. And it's going to be a little cooler. Things are going to be a little cooler. It's going to be a little... Um, a little more appropriate to plant. And if you were to plant these things right now, uh, being so hot, they may just wither away and you won't be able to enjoy them as long. Pansies and mini mums, of course, they'll overwinter and then give you another show uh, in late winter. Now, there's some other things that you could plant, such as um, cabbages, uh, ornamental cabbage or ornamental kale. Uh, those as well as pansies and mums can make a great display for fall. So I hope, Veronica, that, that helps answer your question and that um, uh, you, if you have any other questions about the plants or if you want to come find them, come visit me at Lanier Nursery and Gardens uh, later this month and into early October and we'll be glad to help you out. So this morning we go to the lines with uh, Janet from uh, the Farmer's Market. Uh, hey, Janet, how are you this morning? Hi, Nathan. How are you? Great, great. We're waiting for a good Farmer's Market report. Well, uh, a lot of the produce has, has sold, but we still have oh. green beans, uh, some yellow squash, some green tomatoes. Uh, Barney has some fresh figs as well as fig preserves um, and okra. Oh, great. So you've still got some fresh produce. How about some other goods? Are there some other goods hanging around there? We now have one uh, artisan who's, who's selling some uh, wicker baskets, homemade wicker baskets. Oh, great. Wicker baskets. So we've got not just locally grown uh, products, but also locally handcrafted products as well. Is that right? Yes. 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 Um, the market is kind of, we don't have as many vendors and, and craftspeople as we did earlier in the year, 
but we still do have some mighty fine looking produce and we do have one craftsman today oh great well so now uh how long will the market be open for today i'm sorry i couldn't uh, hear you how long will the market be open for today uh it closes at 12 unless uh, everything is sold out before then. Okay, wonderful. Now, uh, just so we kind of look ahead, um, knowing that our summer vegetables will be wrapping up, um, when do we expect uh, the market, is, will the market be closing in the next few months, or will it stay open as long as it can? It's open for two more Saturdays. Okay, great. So two more Saturdays, folks. You heard that. Janet's down there this morning. If you want to go visit off uh, Freedom Freedom Park, is that right, Janet? That's correct. All right, so just downtown Cleveland at Freedom Park, Janet will be there waving, ushering you in to come get the last bit of okra if uh, if you make it in time. How about that? Okay, great. All right, thanks for joining us, Janet. We appreciate that. That's what we love, of course. I think I say that every day, every, every time we talk about the Farmer's Market Report. Um, you know, locally grown, locally, uh, since I'm a local grower ourselves at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, I... I do have a tender spot in my heart for, for local things, and I hope that you do too, because knowing that you are, um, you know, giving to the community, um, uh, giving back to the community that maybe helps supported you, that's the way I look at it. I grew up, of course, in the uh, South Hall County area, and that's what we're trying to do is give back to our Northeast Georgia folks. So um, definitely check out the uh, farmer's market this morning. We still, of course, have some questions here. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about deer. Um, I think we have to talk about it a lot because it's a big question. Um, a customer of ours, his name is Scott, he um, sent me a message yesterday. I've been talking to him about some hosta problems that he's had. And I think last week, you might remember, I talked about a slime mold issue called dog vomit mold. Ugh, sounds gross, but it looks just like it's described. It doesn't actually hurt plants. It's actually working to, to uh, break down this organic matter, like mulches and leaves that are around the plants. Um, but with that in mind, he also asked, what can I do to keep deer off the hostas? And I know if you have hosta and deer, you're probably laughing because it's going to be a very tough battle and war to win. But here's the reality. Um, you can do some things, of course, um, to help keep uh, deer away from hostas and, and things that um, deer really like. You can, first of all, plant your plants a little closer to the house. They're less likely to, to, to come to the house, even though I'm, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if one tried, if a deer tried to reach into your front door and grab your firstborn. Uh, I think that may happen. But uh, you do plant a little closer to the house. It's less likely for deer to be a problem, but uh, there's a lot of people shaking their heads. Nope, they're still a problem. Of course, there are things you can do as far as um, applications of uh, chemicals. Uh, I should say they are chemicals, but they're organic. They're basically made, the base um, of these chemicals are made from putrescent egg whites, which means rotten, rotten eggs, basically. And we have a product at the nursery uh, that is called Repelzol. It's by Bonide. And of course, this type of product, um, you can apply. It lasts for a couple of months. You may say, well, I need to apply a little bit more. That's okay. It's easy to apply. It's a spray or we have a granule form. Um, and it's uh, based off of the, the animal's sense of smell and taste. If they smell it, they go away. If they taste it, uh, that it's not going to taste good either. But basically smell. So you can apply that to the plants and to the foliage and it's not going to uh, damage or harm the foliage at all. Uh, and then lastly, um, an another quick uh, way you can try to help keep deer away from your plants uh, would be what we call use a web of confusion. The web of confusion is basically going down to the hardware store, the, the bait shop, and getting a roll, a spool, I should say, of a uh, fishing line. doesn't matter what pound test you get because you're not going fishing for fish at least you're going to try to keep deer away and and you want to take the fishing line maybe um set up a few sticks around your plants and kind of wind twine and and wind around that um that fishing line to make this web if that makes sense to make this web around the plant now from a distance you're not going to be able to to see uh the fishing line of course so aesthetically it's not such a big problem which of course you could see it but see the deer don't know what it is and when they start getting their nose in that web they start getting confused hence the web of confusion so those are some ways that you can keep hostas off uh i mean hostas deer off your hostas <laughs> but i will say that if you have a deer problem 
you're not going to want to have a lot of hostas or hydrangeas and things like that because those are candy for deer. Absolutely, they're candy for deer. Uh, so, Scott, to answer your question, I hope that helps. And we have another question here from Salty. Daryl says, Nathan, uh, how do I come up with a good design for my garden? I want something beautiful and visually appealing. Any suggestions? Absolutely, Daryl. So th this is a concept of horticulture that really we, we call horticulture a science and an art. It's one of the few things in life that is both science and art because, of course, we've talked about all of the pests and problems and how plants grow. But then we go to, well, how do we use plants? How do we use plants? There are a few things you'll want to talk about or think about rather when you are doing this and really it's basically those things you learned in art class in high school uh some of the um design uh, pr principles of design uh for instance we would like to use lines you know line is an important thing to use in the garden and you got to think about that when you create in your bed what kind of line are you going to use you're going to use straight harsh edge lines or you're going to use natural curving lines depends on what you're going for but if you're going for a formal look you may go with a uh, straight a more squared uh, garden uh, beds, but if you wanted a more natural or organic feeling garden, you may go with more curves and circles and things like that. So think about line and how you're going to draw out your beds. Uh, another thing is you want to think about form and what type of form are your plants going to take. You're going to have a form that may be globe shaped. There's plenty of plants that get round and just globular. There are some plants that get tall and thin like a column shape. And so you want to use a little bit of both of those to give some good contrast, as well as uh, maybe some some weeping type plants, you know, upright plants. Like said, we have some Japanese maples that are upright uh, as far as trees go. And we have plants, uh, Japanese maples that are weeping. So uh, in many different species, you'll find uh, different forms of plants, uh, types of these plants. Uh, another concept is color. Color is a very important aspect because color is what's going to give you that pop from the road, really. Uh, and if you use contrasting colors, colors that blend well, um, that, that's great. Uh, for instance, you may use a deep green. You may use a deep green color and oppose that with a yellow color and a kind of maroon or red color. So how do you get that? Well, deep green could come from gardenias or uh, azaleas, things like that, um, hollies even. And then your yellows can come from things like... Um, Oh, uh, I'm losing it here. Gold mop cypress. Uh, there's a few abelias, like super gold abelia that gets very bright yellow. Um, or some variegated foliage maybe uh, that has some white in it. Uh, you could also use your red colors coming from like um, Laura Pedlums and whatnot. Uh, Laura Pedlums is a great dark plant. There are some darker leaf uh, trees like smoke bush um, and um, uh, plums. Uh, there's a dark leaf form of plums. So if you use all these different colors, uh, you'll see great visual appeal. Now, of course, color goes into uh, flowers as well. What kind of flowers what scheme would you like to have? Would you like to have a flower scheme that is monochromatic. Monochromatic would be the same color. So a bunch of shades of pinks, dark pinks, light pinks, medium pinks, uh, over the top highlighter pinks, you know, uh, maybe blues, deep blues, uh, sky blues, pale blues. Those would be all the same kind of color. Or you could do high contrast blues and oranges, or maybe yellows and purples, or maybe uh, greens and reds, things like that. Those would be high contrast. Now, uh, we also have the last uh, bit of information I would say is texture and texture is important when we talk about texture you think about well what kind of plants give me broad foliage things like the azaleas things like camellias very large leaves there's a huge leaf called fatsia fatsia japonica is a huge evergreen that just has a huge dinner plate gorgeous but then with all these big leaves you want to use finer textures how do you get finer textures well you find plants that have smaller tinier uh, leaves same things like ferns are kind of come to mind uh, as the top choice ferns give you a great fine texture as well as some of the uh, evergreen um, conifers and whatnot. So there we go with this long diatribe of art in the garden, Daryl. I hope that helps. And if you have a question in your garden or need some design uh, help, just give me a call 706-865-3181 and we'll be right back with more garden goodness.
It's summer, and if you're getting on the road, do a few things before you go. First of all, buckle up every passenger, and especially those under eight, who should be in an approved child safety seat. Put down the phone. Distracted driving is the contributing cause of more and more traffic crashes. And if you've been drinking, get a ride. Call a friend, but don't get behind the wheel. A DUI can cost you $10,000, and it may cost you your job or a night in the Graybar Motel. This is Harris Blackwood of the Governor's Office of Highway Safety asking you to join us in making this a safe summer. With Kinetic Business powered by Windstream, your small business is always a big deal. And now with Office Suite, you can take your office with you wherever you need to go. Make calls, video conference, send faxes or instant messages, and much more with any device. With Office Suite, you can communicate with customers and collaborate with coworkers easily and more affordably than ever. And for a limited time, you can get Office Suite starting at just $22.95 per month. Act now and get your first month free. Order today at windstream.com slash Cleveland. Service terms and conditions apply. Do you want healthy choices in a clean and friendly environment? We have it here at Captain D's. Choose from grilled salmon, grilled tilapia, grilled shrimp, or grilled chicken, and side choices that include green beans, steamed broccoli, baked potatoes, and fresh green salads. All served in a restaurant with an excellent health department rating. Now that's a health care plan that I like. I'm Jim McClure at Captain D's. We're just cooking in the kitchen. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right, folks. Well, here we are. We're back. And we have a caller on the line. I want to remind you that if you'd like to have a question answered, feel free to give us a call, 706-865-3181. But, Kim, how are you this morning? Good. How are you? Awesome. Awesome. What's going on? I understand you got to have a tree removed. Yes. Yesterday, we had a large tree that was diseased and dropping limbs. We had to have it taken out. So now my former shade garden is a sun garden. I see. (laughs) And I just wonder, do I need to start moving plants? Or they're looking kind of wilting. Oh, no. But having this all of a sudden shock with exposure to sun. Yeah, I have hydrangeas, hostas, Uh, different types of ferns. uh, All the good shade plants are now in the sun. Yes, Linton Rose. Okay. Oh, Lord. Well, let me ask you, um, do... What exposure is this part of the house? North, south, east, west? Well, it's it's mostly I would say south east. Okay. But um I was watching it yesterday. I was hoping maybe the house was gonna give it some afternoon shade, but it's still getting a lot of afternoon sun too with the way it's situated. Okay, so it does get a lot of afternoon sun. That's what I was hoping for. Maybe it'd be on mm-hmm. the northern or eastern side. It'd be a little cooler, but since it's kind of situated on the south, um, I know that we're going to be dealing with some sun. So do you have other shady sites where you can place plants? Is the first I do. Question. I do. Of course, they're in the back. And um you know, this is right in front of my front porch, <laughs> so I was yeah. enjoying it, but I, I may be just transitioning to a sun garden out there. Well, that's true. Um, you know, uh, I guess... Or I can put another tree, but I know that's going to take time to yeah, fill it'll take it time. in. And it, and it won't grow fast enough to provide the, the plants that do need shade, uh, good shade. So, uh, let's see. So, that tree that's been providing shade has been there for some time, I guess. Oh, yeah. About 35 years. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So, so we do have this huge exposure. Okay, folks. So, this is a good example of what do we do. Now, luckily, we're, you know, you've had your tree taken down at a pretty good time. Uh, even though it's still hot now, it's going to start getting cooler. And so, if you'd li- like to move the ones that are obviously like some of the ferns I, I don't know the right. hellebores may or may not be okay you may try to pull them a little closer to any of the shady sites you have um the, if you have um uh, the hydrangeas they can handle sun but they they're going to wilt in the sun if they don't get proper moisture that's the only thing so um definitely the hydrangeas i would say you probably want to go ahead and move if you can add them to a border somewhere um where where you do have some of the shade you talked about that would be great um but yeah you're at a good time to move these things um because uh, we're going to get cooler and of course we would never recommend to transplant things in the middle of summer well unless you just 
had to, you know, in this case, you're going to kind of have to. Um, so, but if you wanted to leave some of the things that don't seem to be uh, having such an issue, and, and you may not know that without time, you know, time is going to really tell which can handle it. But like I said, the hydrangeas um, may be some of the ferns, depending on which kinds of ferns. Most of them are going to want a little break at some point in the afternoon, but um, mm -hmm. since it gets afternoon sun. So time will tell with most of these, but I would say that uh, just go ahead and uh, start moving some of these things. But get as much of the root ball when you're transplanting. Get as much of the root ball as you can. Don't just dig right near the plant, but go away from the plant um, at, uh, it's hard to say of kind of where the drip line if, if you you know kind of where the edge mm -hmm. of the plant was kind of start working your way into there without damaging and, and getting rid of as many roots as possible try to keep as many as you can that's the goal there so um i think you've got a big project on your hands but i hope that some of that helps um once you get them all moved in water and keep an eye on them um, until we kind of they start dropping their leaves and whatnot so and if I want to replace my tree, that was a maple. What's ah. a good choice? Okay, so you had a maple. So maples are nice and large trees, not not as large as oaks, of course, over time. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to go back with another maple. Do you know what kind of maple you had? It was a silver maple. Oh. Not a great one. Yeah, well, but back in the 80s, you didn't know that. That's so, right. So silver maple is, we found out, it was highly planted in the 80s, 90s, and now we're finding out it wasn't as good of a plant as we thought. But there are some good, uh, you know, red maples grow relatively fast, um, and they don't have the kind of disease issues that you're finding out the silver does. Um, of course, uh, you can go with some smaller trees, uh, maybe group them together, such as, uh, red buds and dogwoods um, into service berry. I'll tell you, service berry is a great plant because it blooms in the spring, has these gorgeous round leaves all summer, and then in the fall time, it has a beautiful fall color. I mean, unmatched fall color. So instead of having maybe one large tree in your front, you could do a grouping of some smaller trees that would give you uh, the kind of canopy that, uh, that you had before. And I think if you go ahead and plant these this fall, uh, you know, you're, you're getting a, a head on the on the game, we'll say, um, to, um, to, uh, to 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 kind of get some growth going um, and getting those trees as big as you can. So, mm -hmm. OK. OK. All right. Looks like I need to get to work. Yep. Sounds like it. <laughs> but that's OK. Sounds like uh, we're going to have a you're going to have some work on your hands. But thanks for calling this morning and sure. good luck Thank to you. you. Okay, so that, that you know that's funny that bringing up the silver maple. Um, silver maple is uh, oh, we see it uh, right now, but really we see them on the ground, much like Kim here. We see that they are um, they are falling, and they're they're really just not as good of a trees as we want. Uh, they're not as good of a trees as we want. But we continue to go to the lines with John here, and John's got a question for us. How are you, John? Good morning. How are you? Good. Good. We're doing great. What can we do for you? I'd like to know the name of your nursery and the address so I can come down and get some stuff. All right. Sounds like a plan. So uh, I work at L Lanier, like the lake, Lanier Nursery and Gardens. And our address is 4195 Schubert Road. And that's in Flowery Branch. Okay. And that's S C H U. B E R T. Was there something in particular you were going to be looking for? Or? Yeah, we just bought a recently bought a cabin up in the northeast area, awesome. and I want to come and get some uh, like azaleas to put around yeah. that would bloom in different times of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. Yeah, definitely come down, check us out. We'll be glad to show you around, give you some ideas. That's that's the number one thing you want to do when you first start working on a, a new landscape is you you want to find out what you like and what you don't like. And going to a local nursery is definitely the best way to do it because you can look online, but I'll tell you online, we, you can get can some confusion because um, sometimes those plants aren't going to be found around where we are. Um, even though we like them, we may just not be able to find them in our area. So uh, definitely start with your local plant nurseries. And of course, if you come down and visit us. We'll be glad to show you some azaleas and, and more. And also, could I have the phone number, please? Sure. It's uh, 470 two nine zero five four zero five all right thank you very much all right well thanks john thanks so much and we hope to see you soon at the nursery well that was nice of him
call in. I promise you that is we, that was a great call. We appreciate that. That was uh, legitimate there. So, but that's true. It's true, folks. If you want to find stuff that's great for your area, come to a nursery, visit your local nurseryman, ask them questions, get some ideas. Listen, hang around because in the next segment, we're going to have Joe Phillips with Hills and Dales Estate call in and talk about the, the gardens and the histories that deal with the Callaway, uh, the Callaway Estate there in LaGrange. So we'll see you in just a few moments with more gardening goodness. This is Steve Gibson, President of the Board of Directors of the Saltee Nacucci Community Association. The Saltee Nacucci Center with local and regional emergency services is hosting Touch a Truck, a family safety, health, and preparedness fair. This is a free family event with hands-on displays of emergency vehicles, a helicopter fly-in, as well as free medical testings, family support resources, and more. The fun includes Smokey the Bear, Babyland General Nurse Station, a scavenger hunt with cash prizes, musical entertainment, and food. Come honor our first responders and have fun learning about important resources in our community. The Saltina Kitchi Center campus is located at 283 Highway 255 North, next to the post office in Saltina Kitchi. Please join us for Touch a Truck Saturday, September 8th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. For more information, go to www.sncaa.org or call 706-878. 3300. Have you played Apple Mountain yet? Come and experience the most talked about golf course in North Georgia foothills, complete with clubhouse, full line of equipment, driving range, senior discounts, twilight rates, and lessons for beginners as well as accomplished golfers. Open all year, seven days a week. Have you played Apple Mountain yet? Call 706-754-2255 and book your tee time today. Apple Mountain Golf Course off Old Highway 441 on Rockford Creek Road in Clarksville. Georgia is hands-free. That means drivers cannot have a phone in their hands or supported by their body if they want to talk on their phone or use GPS systems. Reading, sending, or writing text messages, emails, or social media posts are all prohibited, even with hands-free devices. You can listen to music streaming apps that don't have video on your screen, but you can't touch your phone while driving to program them. Parking your phone when your car is in drive will save lives. This message brought to you by the Governor's Office of Highway Safety. Patchy fog, then mostly sunny. South wind 5 to 15. 30% chance of afternoon showers and thunderstorms, highs mid 80s. Chance of showers and thunderstorms this evening, low around 70. Tomorrow, chance of showers and thunderstorms early. Then showers and thunderstorms likely in the afternoon, highs low 80s. Monday, showers and thunderstorms likely, highs in the low 80s. Georgia meteorologist John Weatherby in the GNN Weather Center. More great information coming your way on Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right. Well, gang, we are back for the next half hour. We are excited to uh, be here answering your questions. I will give you our phone number one more time, 706-865-3181. If you have a question, we've already answered several questions this morning about what's going on in our landscapes and the kind of troubles and problems that we have. Um, I do want to go with a question here from Kaylin from Pendergrass. She asked this question, can I kill kudzu? And I'm going to answer yes. <laughs> yes, you can. But it's going to be hard. You know, just like our deer problems, uh, fighting kudzu is going to be a tough, tough, uh, tough go. And um, as a matter of fact, if you hang on uh, for a little bit longer, I believe that our garden soliloquy with Ethel is going to talk just about this problem. So I'm glad it's very timely that you asked this question, Kaylin. The key to killing kudzu is to be persistent. That's the goal. Be persistent. You can kill kudzu without uh, chemicals. Um, but you have to be persistent. And I mean, you've got to put it on your calendar and just go out there and mow the tops down, which mowing is very tough because of the stringy stems that they have, the vines, of course. And uh, so you really need to go out there with some kind of chopping machine and just 
cut and cut. And every time you see a new, a new baby pop up, just cut, just keep on cutting. Um, so you've got to be persistent. So that would be a physical control uh, without chemical. But of course, you can use certain chemistries, uh, glyphosate, which has commonly been called Roundup. We sell a product called Cleanup by Bonide that I would uh, rather uh, talk about, of course. But um, uh, Cleanup is glyphosate. Uh, we have a 41% concentrate. You can dilute it. Goes v it lasts for a long time because it's concentrated. And the key, though, with using chemistry uh, with weed control, at least, is to use a surfactant. And a surfactant is basically, we've talked about this before, I know, a few weeks ago, um, is about like using Dawn dish soap, basically, Dawn dish soap. And um, you can add that at the end. Once you've filled your container and put in your chemistry, then add the dish soap or you'll have this sudsy mess coming out of your uh, sprayer. But the surfactant basically does what it does in your kitchen when you clean the grease off of the plate how can you get the grease off with just water well you can't you've got to have something to get in between the grease and the plate right and so Dawn dish soap does that and it works as a pretty decent surfactant uh, in horticulture too so Kalen, you've just got to be persistent you've got to get out there and either never let the green grow whether you're spraying or cutting never let the green grow always cut and always always um big jump right after that kudzu it's a big problem so thanks for calling in kellen but uh now we're gonna uh welcome our guest to the show uh, miss joe phillips with hills and dells estate how are you this morning joe i'm great great well thanks so much for joining us uh we just wanted to let folks uh know a little bit about uh, hills and dales and kind of maybe a little bit of history you can tell us and kind of some of the plants um so let's just start off with that what exactly uh, is hills and dales estate hills and dales is the historic home of entrepreneur and textile magnate fuller callaway senior and his wife ida case and callaway it's been a historic house and garden museum since October of 2004. We've been open to the public for yeah. that long. Yeah. Now, um, now I hear that name Callaway. This is mm -hmm. the Callaway, right? as with Callaway Gardens. Right, and that's uh, what most people key in on whenever they they hear the name Callaway. It's a well-known name in Georgia, and a lot of people associate it with Callaway Gardens, uh, with good reason. And yeah. We do have a connection uh, with Callaway Gardens in that this is the family home of, um, well, let me back up. Uh, Callaway Gardens was begun by Kaysen and Virginia Callaway oh, okay. in the 1950s. And Hills and Dales Estate is the home of Kaysen's father and mother. Mm. So, so it's a much older you know, their place. family home. Uh -huh. I see, much older place. And, and so that's uh, kind of where a lot of history too comes out right i mean um the gardens were were they installed by the um uh the the original callaways there the casings i mean uh no uh actually the gardens predate it being hills and dales estate um that property was owned by a family in the 1800s in the 19th century oh. uh, by the name of Farrell. okay and so, um yeah. it was the Farrell estate and Mrs. Farrell, Sarah Farrell, started a garden there um, in the 1840s. And she and her husband lived there for six decades. Wow. And Fuller Callaway Sr., growing up in Troop County, where uh, the estate's located, oh. knew of the gardens, was well acquainted with the Farrells. And it was after their death that um, he wanted to buy the property because the garden was there. Oh, okay. So, no, you know, it has cool. a long, long history yeah. of, you know, 170 plus years. Wow. So it's got to be one of the oldest gardens in the state at least, right? Yeah. It's actually considered, um, I mean, we didn't give it this oh, title, but it's considered by garden historians to be one of the best preserved 19th century gardens in the whole country oh wow yeah well I, I will say that the website is beautiful and that's a great place to start uh the journey into hills and dales but i mean uh, you know we know we know callaway gardens now is this near callaway gardens where can people actually come where do they come to visit uh, hills yes and dales? it is in lagrange georgia and callaway gardens is actually about 17 miles south oh. of lagrange in pine mountain yeah. so 
it's just the neighboring county. And LaGrange is about one hour south of the Atlanta airport. It's right off of Interstate 85. And so that kind of gives people a, a location yeah. of where it's at. You go south and west of the airport on the interstate, and it's right right close to the Georgia-Alabama line in yeah. west central Georgia. Okay, yeah. So you could, if you got up early, you could probably make a day trip of it. Uh, or, well, a lot of people do that. Yeah, or hang around and maybe mm-hmm. go visit Hills and Dales and Callaway Gardens for a weekend mm-hmm. or so. So if um, someone were to come visit, kind of, what would be the – general touring experience they'll get what all is entailed in visiting hills and dales um well visitors are usually they're routed at our entrance to our visitor center Mm -hmm. and at the visitor center they get ticketing information and can also view an orientation video Um, there are exhibits there at the visitor center and if they choose to To tour the estate, then most guests opt to get trammed up to the house because the estate covers 35 acres. And so we don't expect people to, you know, to walk that whole way unless unless they're, you know, they they do have that option if they want to. But anyway, they're usually trammed up to the home and garden and um, tickets are structured so they can they can get a house and garden ticket or just a garden. Most people, if they've never been there before, want to tour the house as well. They get a guided house tour. And then the garden is typically self-guided with a map. Um, Okay. And then so after your guided tour in the house, you can kind of walk at your leisure and enjoy the gardens. and That's correct. Learn some information with the map and mm-hmm. all that. Oh, that's great. Now, now I know that when people come visit that they're going to get some good ideas probably for their own garden. So what are some of the um, biggest uh, attractions or features um, that Hills and Dells is known for as far as gardens go? Well, the old feral garden, which is kind of the centerpiece, mm-hmm. it's, you know, right there south of the house. You know, the, the, the home looks out over is a terraced boxwood garden. Uh, boxwood parterre garden and so it's constructed formally on a series of six terraces with stone walls and a fountain and statuary Mm. Um, but there are also ideas for people that you know don't have a a formal landscape as well we also have an herb garden Um, there's a greenhouse all of those were put in by the Callaway family a courtyard garden, perennial border, um, and one unique feature about the historic garden that you know, really stands out is that uh, it's one of the only examples that we know of that was designed around um, a religious motif. Mrs. Farrell was mm. uh, a woman of great faith, yeah. and she planted a lot of her faith in the garden. Wow. And it gives it some whimsy, and it also gives it a very, very spiritual feel to it that's quite unique. And yeah. we also have a lot of her original plantings in the garden. Her oh, wow. design is all intact, it, you know, the garden, the way that it's laid out and structured. And then we have a number of her old trees that she planted, southern magnolias that she planted from seed. An old wow. ginkgo, an old china fir, um, original boxwood. Uh, every boxwood is not original to the 18th century, but sure. quite a number of them still are. Oh, wow. So a lot of these plants that are there, you we're looking back into history because they would have been planted by her from, like you mentioned, seed or young plants, and now they're they're huge trees and, and whatnot, right? That's correct. That's wow, correct. that's crazy. So that's mm-hmm. so see, that's one thing is you know we think about like the old houses and structures have a lot of history, but gardens themselves can have a lot of history attached to them. And and I like you mentioned about the faith part because it's kind of hard to to grow something and, and maybe not uh, not have faith, you know, because you're going to plant a seed and hey, you're going to have faith. It's going to grow. So that's that's correct. Yeah, that's yeah. absolutely correct. When I think about her gardening through the Civil War era. Oh, good point. And, you know, it's such a, a time of of upheaval, of social upheaval. And, yeah. you know, she had a lot of faith to, you know, that it would survive, that it would sure. continue on. And, you know, planting, when you plant 
a tree, you are definitely planting for the future because right. most of the time the gardener may not even see that tree in its full maturity. That's right. Yes, yeah, so, uh, I've read a quote somewhere that said, you know, you're, you really understand gardening when you realize that, you know, you're going to plant a tree that you may never sit underneath its shade, you know, so <laughs> that's, true. That, that's very that's true. true. And that's the case here at Hills and Dales. And so, you know, she kind of started all this, but now I want to kind of transition to maybe modern day here, uh, what all you do um, there at the gardens, what's your responsibilities now that she's kind of started all this and you got a team of folks that kind of curating and keeping things cultivating, right? That's correct. Uh, we are very privileged in that, you know, her garden is still there right. because uh, the family that purchased the property, the Callaway family, mm -hmm. wanted to preserve it. Mm -hmm. And so it is a great representation of historic garden preservation. And so that's a lot of what we do. We are we still take care of that historic garden and try to make sure that it will be there for years to come for people to come and enjoy. Yeah. And so we are maintainers uh, in the, in the purest sense, which is, yeah. you know, not glamorous work, <laughs> right. no, of course but not. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> we tend and take care of the garden that was already there. Yeah. Um, and we try to keep it interesting for the public to come, you know, have color where we can have color yeah. for people to come and see and get ideas. And one thing that I like to point out to people is that it has a very European feel to the garden. Um, mm. The house is an Italianate design, and it oh, wow. reminded the architects that designed the house. They were Georgia architects, by the way, oh, wow. um, Neil Reed and Hal Hint. And it remind the garden reminded them so much of gardens that they had seen in Europe, particularly in Italy. They designed that house to complement the garden. So when you come there, you do get a feel, a touch of Italy. Oh wow! Uh, whenever you come and tour, so and you don't have to don't have to travel so, that uh, far to see. That's it. right, a touch of Italy in middle Georgia, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, Joe, I do appreciate you joining us. Um, I would like to say one, ask one last question as far as how can people keep in touch or get connected with Hills and Dales? I know, it's, like I mentioned earlier, it's got a beautiful website. Are you on social media and things like that? We are. We have a Facebook page. It's real easy to find. Just you know, search for Hills and Dales Estate. Okay. We're on Instagram as well. Um, and you can, you know, keep current with all the events that are happening at the estate. We do have programs that people can enjoy if mm -hmm. they want to. We'll be decorated for Christmas. The home oh. will be all decked out for the holidays come December yeah. um, with all uh, fresh and natural things. Um, we use fresh greenery and fresh plants and some dried oh. uh, material as well, but it's all natural, which is the way that um, Mrs. Alice Calloway loved things. She was yeah. the last person that lived in the house. Oh, yeah. But anyway, they can stay current uh, with us through the website, okay. Facebook, or Instagram. Well, it sounds like it's always a good time to visit Hills and Dells, isn't it? Yes. We're open year-round. <laughs> open year-round. All right. Mm -hmm. Year-round, Tuesday through Saturday. Yeah. So um, people can come anytime that they can fit us into their schedule. Yep. Well, sounds like a plan. Well, thanks again, Joe, for uh, hanging out with us this morning. I really appreciate you taking the time. And we're going to a break, but um, I am going to tell you that um, this morning, hang on, because Ethel is giving her soliloquy and also my plan of the week in our last segment. We'll see you in just a few moments. It's summer, and if you're getting on the road, do a few things before you go. First of all, buckle up every passenger, and especially those under eight, who should be in an approved child safety seat. Put down the phone. Distracted driving is the contributing cause of more and more traffic crashes. And if you've been drinking, get a ride, call a friend, but don't get behind the wheel. A DUI can cost you $10,000, and it may cost you your job or a night in the Gray Bar Motel. This is Harris Blackwood of the Governor's Office of Highway Safety asking you to join us in making this a safe summer. 
Hi, folks. It's Mark again with Dr. Don Robbins Optometrist Office. You know, sometimes people feel that they have to drive a long way to get a good deal on glasses. That's just not true. In our office, we have single vision frame and lens packages for $50, and that's with a one year warranty against breakage or scratches. We also have the most current technology lens and frames. We have glasses for every budget. Call and make an appointment at 706-865-2020 or just come in to see us at 514 West Keitel Street in Cleveland. With lawn and gardening work underway, Charlie and Bradley at Nick's Hardware want you to know that they're ready to help you get the tools that you need. They're offering some special buys on a nice selection of snapper, zero turn, rear engine mowers right now. Stop in and check out special savings available. Nick's also has quality echo blowers, grass and hedge trimmers, along with chainsaws. Remember, your equipment comes assembled ready to use when you buy at Nick's. Nick's Hardware and Furniture on the Square, downtown Cleveland. Back to more, let's get growing with Nathan Wilson. All right, gang, we are back here. We're going to start off uh, this next segment, of course, with ethyl soliloquy, like I kind of uh, alluded to earlier. Um, we answered a question from Pendergrass about kudzu, and I believe that Ethel has a very similar problem. So let's um, take, uh, take a look at what's going on in her soliloquy this morning. And now it's time for another garden soliloquy with Ethel. Because when a weed creeps into her garden, she attacks it with a vengeance of a hundred thousand men. Dear kudzu plant, or should I say, spine of Satan, since your introduction into the U.S. in 1876, you have been a major pain. I'm sorry to be so frank, but you really are the Frankenstein of the garden. Your hairy, overgrown vines and leaves make me want to scream or jump over Niagara Falls without a parachute. I can't believe that you have made a foothold in my garden. I mean, I have literally watched you grow and crawl across the garden at least one to three feet every day. Why, just the other day I was sitting on the patio sipping my coffee, enjoying the fragrance of tea olive and the sound of the songbirds. When all of a sudden, I feel something grabbing a hold of my leg. As I looked down, I noticed that you were twining around my leg, heading straight for my petticoat. No siree! Thanks to Betsy that my pruning shears were nearby, or I'm afraid you would have devoured me like you've overtaken so many old pine trees. I really don't appreciate your forwardness. I will make it my life's ambition to eradicate you and all of your pesky friends. As God is my witness, you're not going to lick me. I'm going to live through this, and when it's all over, you'll never grow in my garden again. No, nor any of my friends' gardens. If I have to lie, steal, cheat, or kill, as God is my witness, you'll never grow in my garden again. Yours truly, Ethel. Oh, good old Ethel. She is just on a rampage today. It's almost like a war going on. It's a war going on in her garden, and that is the case with kudzu. So this morning, um, we continue to answer your questions. Hanging on for Plan of the Week uh, before we wrap up. Uh, feel free to give me a call, 706-865-3181. But I do go to a batch of questions we have here. One from Butch. Butch doesn't tell us where he's from, but uh, maybe he's local. Probably. Hopefully. Many of my perennial flowers have turned brown and look gross. Uh, can, can, I, can I cut them back? Can I cut them back? So your perennial flowers are looking pretty bad. You sure can cut them back. Um, basically, we would call this deadheading. Uh, most likely, the plant is very much alive, um, but the, the, the flowers have faded. The petals are looking brown and sad. And so you can. That's uh, deadheading is uh, one of the things that you want to do. What that means is you go in with a pair of printing shears. You may even be able to pair a, a, use a pair of um, scissors even. Um, if the plant's not thick enough, you know, and so you go in and you just trim back and cut off the old heads. That will encourage a little more blooming, probably uh, many of these perennials before it gets cold. But I would say to do that, Butch, I would say to do that pretty soon. I would say um, 
probably this weekend. Today, if you can, uh, that would be the best time to do it. Really, last weekend would have been ideal. But you can go ahead and deadhead. You're not going to hurt anything. But I will uh, uh, hit you with this too, Butch, that many of our birds, native birds and little critters, they actually feed on some of the seeds um, that these perennial flowers uh, will produce. So you may want to cut them back just for the beauty of it but uh if you want to help nature out you may uh, leave them remaining leave them standing up and let them go through the winter and as a matter of fact but you know we talked a little bit about garden design earlier one thing with perennial borders is that many of these old flower heads seed heads you know they may be brown they may look bad now but throughout winter boy just having that silhouetting of um, these unique flower shapes, whether it's a disc flower like a Shasta daisy or whether it's um, like goldenrod with its light, airy, wispy um, uh, seed heads, they can overwinter pretty well and give you some really good, um, some really good, uh, something to look at during the winter rather, rather than just whacking them to the ground and having bare soil. So uh, you can cut them back. Deadhead is always appropriate, but um, of course, like I said, maybe hang on and, and do them that way. So, uh, but but this has been is, is a wonderful day to get outside to do some light tasks because, folks, I want to remind you that even though we're in September, we're not through summer yet. I mean, you know, the calendar says the 22nd or whatever is, uh, is fall, but weather-wise, we never really know. Go ahead and write on your calendar October 15th because that is going to be our average first frost date. October 15th is our average first frost. Now, what that means is sometimes we have frost before that and sometimes we have frost after that. But if you know that somewhere around October 15th, it's going to get kind of cool, cold at night. Um, it's going to first frost would mean somewhere in the mid 30s uh, at nighttime. Just know that, hey, we've only got a little over maybe five weeks, I guess, now. Um, before this cold comes through but of course we may stay very warm up until the end of october into november i mean sometimes the day temperatures are really um awesome and warm and then it's cooler at night um but it's the night time that really is it, it, anytime we have a a few hours of cold weather plants that are tender can be hurt um, plants that have put out new growth, the new growth could be damaged. That's why I'm recommending to do all of these garden activities now because you still have four to six, well, four to five weeks, I guess, of maybe a good um, time for these plants to harden off after they've grown because we don't want to go in October 15th and start pruning. We don't want to do it in November or December. Like we talked about last week, there is no good time to prune but fall time and winter time is the worst because what you're doing is you're cutting the plant. You're actually damaging the plant and you don't want water or disease to get in there over winter because the plant is not actively growing and it cannot heal itself throughout these uh, terrible uh, winter weather when it's, when the plant's dormant. So it's like getting a cut on your arm and never healing. It's just not a good thing. It can lead into infection, lead to disease. And by next spring, you're wondering, well, why did all my plants die? Well, because of winter damage and maybe some disease issues. So that's kind of what we're looking at there. But this morning, we I would like to introduce a new plant to you. Maybe it's a new one. Maybe it's an old one. But either, regardless, it's a great plant. We pre-recorded this segment, and we want to share it with you. Of course, it's my plant of the week. Today's plant of the week is brought to you by the legume family, a family of plants that not only includes beans and peas, but also takes nitrogen from the air and deposits it into your soil. However, today we are going to talk about Amethyst Falls Wisteria, which is a cultivar of our native wisteria. Now let me be clear that we are not talking about the highly invasive Chinese and Japanese wisterias, which have overtaken our woodlands and roadways. I would never recommend that plant for cultivation, only for the compost pile. Amethyst Falls Wisteria, on the other hand, is a great choice for the garden. It's a climber, so it'll add grace and beauty to your vertical garden. Amethyst Falls Wisteria blooms primarily in the spring, but I've seen it continue to bloom on and off throughout summer. The blossoms of this plant are simply gorgeous. The lilac purple flowers hang down in cone-shaped groupings, which give an air of mystery and intrigue if allowed to grow across arbors or pergolas. You'll get the best flowering by allowing it to grow in full sun. However, American wisteria can handle some part shade as well. The pest-resistant foliage is feather-like, meaning that leaves are set across from each other on the stem, sort of like a fern. The blue-green leaves make a fresh and dramatic background for the soft purple flowers. Oh, and I need to mention that the flowers are awesome. 
so sweetly fragrant. As I mentioned earlier, American wisteria is a native climber and is found indigenously growing in the eastern U.S., where it inhabits moist areas such as stream borders, damp thickets, and swampy woods. Its natural range spans north to south from Virginia to Florida, s to Illinois and Texas. One last interesting fact. Our American wisteria and the terrible Chinese type twine their branches in a counterclockwise fashion, while the other invasive type from Japan twists in a clockwise manner. Very interesting, don't you think? However, I do wonder just how big of a plant nerd was the guy who figured that out. Jeez. Definitely consider the mysterious splendor of Amethyst Falls Wisteria. She's beautiful, native, and always available at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. Amethyst Falls Wisteria, a great native plant that's climbing to keep you shady and cool. And it's my plant of the week. Well, there we go. That is a beautiful plant that I hope that you will take a look at. Um, of course, at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, where it is available, uh, if you need something to climb and crawl and uh, kind of fill over an arbor or whatever, it's a great thing to do there. I tell you what, if you've, if you've missed any of these uh, shows or soliloquies or plant of the week, feel free to go to youtube.com and search WRWH and you can find all of our shows there. We'll see you next week, folks. This is Nathan Wilson with Let's Get Growing Together. Thanks for joining us for today's Let's Get Growing program with Nathan Wilson. If you have a comment about today's program, you can reach out to Nathan by sending an email to grow at LanierNurseryGardens.com. Join us next Saturday for Let's Get Growing on Local News Radio 93.9 FM and AM 1350.